Thank you, Fadi. All right, uh, Charlie uh, gave us a little bit of description of the freshman class. Uh, we just had a very good kickoff discussion on the context of why we're here today, and a lot of that discussion will continue. Uh, the next portion of the program is actually to meet some of the freshman class. Who are these iGeneration students? So I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Sweeney, who is going to moderate a panel discussion of our freshman class students, our iGeneration students, uh, and we'll talk a little bit, uh, uh, they'll, well, I'll leave it to Rich to describe. Rich? This is the fun part. We get to see whether I'm going down in a flaming wreck or whether I can actually call shots. So I'm about to tell you what the research says that these students will tell you. All right? So I'm really out on the, on the deck here. I'm, I'm on the plank. My toes are off the end, and I'm ready to take the, take the drink. Um, we're going to do a live focus group. I've done about 60-some of these. I've done them in at Yale, I've done it at Michigan, and I've done it at uh, Georgia Tech. Um, but this is a different group. This is a group uh, that may, in fact, not even be millennials. They may be the next generation beyond the millennials. So we'll t we're going to have an opportunity to, uh, to discuss this in depth. The first 15 minutes, I'll present the research. Then for the next half hour, I'm going to ask them questions, including the kinds of questions we just heard. Uh, Dr. Blodikas, uh, you, you said exactly the kind of structure that this group looks forward to. Because they come from, this is a group that was taken from one event to the other. Um, they went from play dates to, uh, to uh, soccer games to orchestras and so forth and so on. Um, and they were protected all that, in all that environment. And all of a sudden, they're coming into college. Um, it's no surprise that they're going to wind up the way they're going to wind up. You will have an opportunity in the last 15 minutes to ask your own questions. Please think about what questions you'd like to ask them. The goals today are simple. Learn some of the expectations, characteristics, and behaviors of incoming freshmen. They're all incoming freshmen. And learn what freshman instructors could do to better engage our students and improve our learning success. Uh, by the way, in 1995, the same year I came to NGIT, I've given away my, how old I am at, uh, the same year, the internet was commercialized for the first time. And this group of college students typically was born that year, those that are around 18. So you get some notion of the scale and the timing. These are the birth years of all of the students. You'll know in this, this is, or excuse me, all of the, uh, the people from 1909 to 2009 on the right. And in the center, you see the baby boomers. That's the, the, uh, the bulge. When you add the generations to them, you see all of a sudden that uh, the millennials actually started to grow a little bit. Uh, they kind of troughed, and now they're going to be growing again with the I generation. Um, by the way, the I generation is with a question mark because literally nobody knows yet what the generation is, and I'll show you that too. The silent generation uh, is the one before the baby boomers, and they're pretty much, as of depending upon obviously the in industry and so forth, they're pretty much all out of the workforce. And now we're having baby boomers starting to retire in big numbers. So here's an article. Uh, the article is from USA Today. What is, what's the name that we're giving to this next generation? Well, unfortunately, you don't know until after they've graduated from high school and they have developed some of their behaviors and characteristics. So the answer is, we don't know yet. Uh, iGen is my favorite name, but I have really no idea what, what they're going to call themselves. If you consider the workforce to be those between 23 and 67, basically all of the boomers, all the Gen X, and, all of the, and, mo and half of the millennials are right now in the workforce. In 10 years, that will change. Half the boomers will be retired. The millennials will be entirely in the workforce, and maybe even some of the I generation. The I generation might be, in fact, there's an argument about the starting dates of, that, of the I generation. But I, I consider 1995 to be the appropriate date, the day the internet uh, was commercialized. College Board says this is what's happening to high school students. You'll notice the, the great 
rise from for 1994 to 2008, which was the pinnacle year, the top year in terms of high school students entering college or graduating from high school, actually. Uh, and then what you see is a trough, a slight trough. And this plays itself out differently in state to state. In the New Jersey, the incline was much, much greater. So it's not surprising that in New Jersey, our population of students rose so quickly. Um, but you'll see that from 2008 until today, that it's actually gone down a little bit. bit. But our population has not, which is significant. Uh, you'll notice that it'll be about 2017 or 2018 before the number of students coming out of high school begins to approach the number of students uh, that we had in 2008. What are, who are this generation? Well, there was a study done a few years ago on the older generation, the millennials. I, I have a real hard time talking of millennials as being the older generation. But some of you, some of your advisors, some of your teachers right here in this room are in millennials. Uh, what are their characteristics? Warm, reasoning, emotional stability. How did they do these studies? Well, it was a longitudinal um, personality factor test, standardized test that was applied to medical school students over years. And what they found was these characteristics were the characteristics of this generation. There was one, genera one characteristic that didn't come out, and it's very, very apropos to some of the things that we've talked about this morning. They are less solitary less individualistic, and less self-reliant. They're much more likely to go and ask the friend when they, need, when they have a problem than they are just go and solve it. Um, now, this is, this is a study that was done with the generation that began, or that was born in, up until 1989. Let's look at some more recent studies. This, by the way, they also said millennials have greater needs to belong to social groups and to share with others stronger team instincts and tighter peer bonds and greater needs to achieve and, and succeed. They do have a greater need to succeed, but they don't always put in the effort. Um, there's a recent study that was done that shows that there's a remarkable similar analysis uh, in the yearly increases in college students' narcissistic traits with students in most recent years scoring higher than their predecessors. This is on a number of studies. This clearly supports the generational differences model the larger cultural differences in parenting, education, family life, and the media toward greater individualism have apparently affected the personality traits of individuals. I am special is the name of that game. It's possible this sense of entitlement, it's possible that this sense of entitlement came through all of these years of being taken out to these programs. We live in Lake Wobegon. No, every, there's nobody who is not above average. The school programs with, with, our, have, with our themes are I am special. The, this is very apropos of what we just talked about with majors. A recent study, this is article called Faculty Gatekeepers and Academic Taste in Undergraduate Students' Choice of Major says, introductory classes are disproportionately important to students' development of academic taste and hence their persistence in academic fields. This study was done longitudinally over a number of years with focus groups of different students. The third point at the bottom is really, really heavy. A few great teachers have a disproportionate and positive effect upon students. It also says, by the way, that, that, and, and that they are equally likely to write off a field based on a single negative experience with a professor. One experience, not the entire course. It may be happened in one class that they write off a professor, and if that professor represents the program to them, the major to them, they leave the program. Here's a study that was done by CourseSmart. I want to move into some of the technology areas just for a moment. 99% of the students, not surprisingly, surveyed reported having at least one digital device. And while laptops were the most common, 93%, 93% owned laptops. Many students now own their own smartphones, 78%, and tablets, about 35% of them. This is a significant increase from our 2011 sur survey. This is Course Smart survey. You can see it at the bottom. Anybody who wants to look at any of the citations, I, I have all this available on my website, and I'll be glad to send it to you. Um, what's really important is that they, they use three or more devices every day. And 
how do you learn anything when you check your text every 10 minutes? The, just the constant interruption has got to affect your ability to concentrate. Every 10 minutes, that's what they admitted to, almost half of them. 59% of the students say they are more likely to bring a laptop or a tablet to class. Now remember, 93% of them own laptops. 59% bring them to the, cl the class. Why? Do we know why? Well, the answer is security. The answer is that they don't have get power. They need to store the, mach the uh, machine at some place and so forth. Almost all students surveyed, 90%, admitted they don't always complete the required reading in time for class. This is not a big surprise for me. Of those students, a majority, 53%, report they would be more likely to complete that reading if the material was available digitally and could be viewed on mobile devices. 88% of students say they have used mobile devices for last minute studying before a test. I'm going to test all of these questions, by the way, with this group as they come in in a few minutes. 79% of the students felt that technology such as mobile devices, digital textbooks, e-readers, and tablets save them time when studying and learning. 64% say, say technology saves them time as much as two hours a day. They believe that. The faculty don't believe that historically by the studies. Blended learning environments. Blended learning environments, for those who are not uh, familiar with the terminology, are face-to-face -face classes where some of the classes are given online or in, in some kind of automated fashion. Even with varying levels of sophistication among blended learning experiences, the vast majority of our students, 70%, said they are the, um, these are the environments in which they learn the most. This study, by the way, this study is done by EDUCAUSE. EDUCAUSE is the Center for Applied Research for Higher Education. When was the last time we looked at what research was being produced in higher education? How many of you have read an ECAR report in the last year? It's, if we don't know what this, if the evidence is out there and we're not reading and we're not paying attention to it, then we're not learning. We're not going to improve, we're all, it's only anecdotal. It's our own thoughts on how things should improve. What do, what do they know? Well, few students agreed they skip class when course materials are available online. So if you put the course materials online, will they skip class? 16% said maybe, most of them said no. It's not, it's not the overwhelming majority. What about some of the others uh, that are not substantial, substantial but not surprising? Smartphones are now everywhere, so they're going to get web access everywhere. Um, they can get access to their materials everywhere, so they could use their time appropriately. I just spent too much time with my granddaughter who was uh, here visiting, taking a course at NJIT, and every time, every time I stopped speaking for 10 seconds, she was already on, the, on her machine. By the way, she's got the iPhone, and she's got the iPad, and she's got all of the other technology. A few surprising results. Substantial growth in, growth in the use of e-portfolios. This is getting to be much, much more important to students and much more important to faculty and universities. Here's this, here's the, uh, this graph shows that open educational resources, those which are available free on the web, the students want to see much more use of um, by the faculty. Why? Because they don't have to pay for it and they can get access to it anywhere, anytime. Simulations or educational games, they like, but they're not being produced in, in great numbers and those that are, are not being used necessarily by their faculty in, in part of the learning exercises. What we have seen is a change in the cell phones. Cell phone use has dropped while smartphones use has increased. Desktop computers has dropped Laptop computers has increased. PDAs disappeared. Uh, we now have, we now have uh, some new technologies, tablets and e-readers, which are starting to make a mark. But even if you notice on that curve on the bottom right-hand part of the screen, e, uh, the e-readers the, um, e are not taking off like everybody expected. Laptops, almost everybody has them. Smartphones have really grown, which is really historic because it costs a lot of money for smartphones and parents have to spring for that money. So it's taken a while for the smartphones to grow, to, to proliferate, excuse me, proliferate, such as um, when you compare it to uh, 
let's say, other cheaper resources, things that they have. Um, anyway, tablets are small, e-readers are small. There was a study done in 2010. The study time for full-time students, this gets back to how much studying is taking place. The study time for full-time students at four-year colleges in the United States fell from 24 hours per week in 1961 to 14 hours per week in 2003. 24 to 14. Um, the decline is not explained by changes over time in student work status, parental education, major choice, or the type of institution students attended. Only a small fraction of the change in time can be accounted for by changes in work hours. Further, students do not appear to have reduced study time to pay for, to work for pay. Students appear to be studying less in order to have more leisure time. I think they're coming to college for their leisure time. They're, the, the bottom line here is the only one I wanted you to pay attention to. 30% of the students acknowledge they use the phone as a way of avoiding interacting with others. That's, that's a large number. That's a huge percentage. And it's exactly the opposite of what you need to have in an, in an educational environment. Cheating. Unfortunately, student behavior and attitudes show that a majority of students violate standards of academic integrity to some degree and that high, achiever, high achievers are just li as likely to do it as others. Moreover, there is evidence that the problem has worsened over the last few decades. Our problems here are not unique to NJIT. It's, they're go across the country. Um, the, the reasons for this, they speculate, are cheating has become easier and more widely tolerated. And both school and parents have failed to give students strong, repetitive message about what is allowed and what is prohibited. If you don't speak about it, you, you, you've already spoken. You basically said it's not an important matter. They're highly, re to, to engage them in discussions, th this group is very open and socially bold. But if, they're, if they get raked, if you will, if they get highly criticized, they will be reluctant to speak in class. And, and they're unsure of how their comments will be received. We're going to test this today. Um, lastly, I, there, there's some do's and don'ts in terms of uh, classroom discussions. I'm going to leave that for later so we can get right to the students. But here's a couple points that they made that I think are really valid. First, don't let a student feel isolated or unsupported in a discussion. Second, argue or openly disagree with a student during a discussion. When you openly disagree with a student, you're shutting them down. And it's likely that they're not going to talk about it. You can have a dialogue, but you need to be open and let, let, it, let it be free. Ask questions or engage in discussions in which there is only one correct answer. If you ask them a yes or no question, then obviously you put them in the position of giving the wrong answer, if they get the wrong answer. They have a 50-50 chance. And don't create an authoritarian classroom atmosphere. There's studies that were done in the 1980s that are considered pre the, the top studies in the field of education. And it's amazing to me that people don't hear, don't know much about these. This was done by Benjamin Bloom, who was an expert in the 1980s. What he found was that students who took mastery learning in the classroom, I'll explain that in a second, uh, score on average better than 84% of the students in a traditional classroom. That's called the one sigma effect, and it's huge. Mastery learning means that you learn unit A perfectly before you move on to unit B. If you don't learn unit A, you don't move on to unit B. You've got to get the A in, in trig to move on to, to calc. Um, what is mastery learning? I explained it a second ago, but in mastery learning, students must fully understand, understand, demonstrate mastery of the material before moving on to the next topic. What's more striking than that was Bloom found out that there's a way to improve that even, even further called the Sigma II. And the most striking finding was that private tutoring, if you were privately tutored in a class, compared to students in a traditional class, you will score on average better than 98% of those students, called the Sigma II effect. Let me repeat that. That Sigma II effect means that you scored better, on, you're the average student, 
and you scored better than 80, or excuse me, 98% of the students in a conventional classroom. Uh, Dr. Deke mentioned an admitted student is a qualified student. This proves it. It really proves it. It means that those students can learn if we give them opportunities. But can, we can't necessarily facilitate uh, private tutoring of every student. But there are certain students that we can, and we do, and we have tutoring here. That's, that's called the Sigma II problem. How do we change so that the group instruction, the methods of group instruction, are as effective as one-on-one -on -one teaching? We've known this for all these years, and now we're starting to see in things like machine learning and adaptive learning, if you will, we're starting to see some changes that it's used in conjunction with faculty in the classroom who are motivating students. It works. It fundamentally works. And by the way, it captures the students where they're at because they like lots of feedback. How much feedback do we get in the mo does an average student get in the course of an hour in a typical class? of their own? How much time are they spending asking questions or making points? This is the, the, what the study shows in a graphical manner. But the conventional classrooms with 30 students, you get, obviously, the mid-student mid is somewhere in the 50 percentile. Uh, mastery learning students is close to 84 percent. And tutorial students are in the 98 percent. And he finishes with this most important statement. And this gets to our own inability to make good decisions sometimes. Teachers are frequently unaware of the fact that they are providing more favorable conditions of learning for some students than they are for other students. Generally, they are under the impression that all students in their classes are given equal opportunity for learning. Now our incoming freshmen, can we bring them in, Blake, please? We're going to have an opportunity to ask them questions, as I said. Hi. Uh, Go ahead and right grab on a chair. Across and grab your first seat. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Welcome to NJIT. Have I told you? Anybody said welcome to NJIT? Do you? Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming here. All right. We'll need a couple people down here. There are three spots down here. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rich Sweeney. I'm the university librarian. And I'm going to be the moderator of your panel today. Uh, I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. It was very kind of you. <laughs> this focus group will be co-chaired by Blake Hagerty, who is the assistant director of instructional design, and myself. And we'll ask you many questions dealing with learning, communication, and technology use. The information will be used to see what instructors of freshmen um, could learn that might improve freshman learning and satisfaction. This focus group is being recorded and transcribed for the teaching. Did you all sign a waiver? Thank you. Good. Nice. All right. Good. Good. Uh, nice to know. Uh, I, won't get, I won't be carried out of here by some law official. This focus group will be about 45 minutes, including the last 15 minutes. The faculty are going to ask you questions. All right. We're just trying to learn what we can do to improve success with our freshman students. All right? That's what it's all about. Um, press the button when you want to speak on your microphone, and the red light will come on. When you don't want to speak anymore, please turn it off by pushing the button, and the light will go out. All right? I think we, everybody got that? All right, this is a test. All right, please keep your answers short and to the point. Please introduce yourself now. Um, including your year of birth, your name, your year of birth, the high school and town from which you graduated. Basically, everybody's from a different high school. We took care to make sure that that was part. I didn't hear you. Yes, We're, and the town from which you graduated, your major, if you have one, and why you chose your college major. Please also tell us one special thing about yourself. All right? One special thing about yourself that helps us to, to know who you are. All right? So because that qu last question might stagger some people, who would like to start? We'll start, OK, you're, we'll start with you, and we'll go down this way, all right? So you can all think about that. Go ahead, please. Raymond? Yeah. Hi, my name is Ray Kolodovsky. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. I was born in 1995. I went to Livingston High School, town Livingston. It's about 20 minutes from here, down I-280. 
Uh, my major is going to be electrical engineering. I've just kind of been meddling around with circuits since as long as I can remember. And I just figured that was kind of the best fit. Uh, one interesting thing about me, I run a business doing computer repair and building custom computers for people. Kind of love it, you know, it's just one of those things that stick with your whole life and just, it's awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello, my name is Hal Chaudhry, uh, born in 95. Um, I'm from Ridgewater, New Jersey. I went to the Academy uh, for Health and Medical Sciences. It's about 40 minutes away from here. Um, my major is going to be biomedical engineering and I chose this major because I really love medicine, but I also am very uh, keen on engineering and all the uh, mathematical concepts. So, you know, why not both? Why not combine the best of both worlds? Um, one special thing about me is I love basketball. I, it's my passion. I love playing it every single day. So it, it's one of the best things I'm, I can do right now. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ashley Lofgren. I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. I went to Bishop Burrow and I'm going to be majoring in biology. And something special about me is that I'm playing on the women's soccer team here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Felipe Arujo. Um, I was born in 93. I, I graduated from Alexander Hamilton Prep Academy in Elizabeth, which is 15 minutes away from here. Uh, I'm majoring in civil engineering. One interesting, uh, why I chose civil engineering was because I was introduced at a very early age. One of my best friends in Brazil, which I, I came from, I lived there for 15 years. And uh, one of my best friends, his dad owned a company and then he introduced me when I was 12 and I just fell in love with it. One interesting thing about me is that um, I think I'm very diverse in athleticism and academics. Um, I went to many programs of engineering. I, I played sports for varsity. I was captain of most of them. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joshua Williams. Uh, I was born in 1995. I went to school at St. Benedict's Prep here in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and my major of choice is computer science. And I chose computer science because, not just because I, I like computers, but also because there seems there's a very small lack of computer scientists in the world, especially African-American computer scientists. So I thought that you know, I should try to feel this um, sort of demand or lack thereof, so. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Karen David. I went to Biotechnology High School in Freehold, New Jersey. I'm actually from Matawan, New Jersey in Monmouth County. Uh, I'll be doing chemical engineering here. Uh, the reason being that I've always really liked chemistry and problem solving. My dad was a, um, a civil engineer and my mom a chemist, so I'm kind of like a mashup of both of them. And interesting, an interesting fact is that both my parents uh, got their masters here, but I didn't know that until after I committed here for soccer. They just didn't bother to tell me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Courtney McHugh. I'm from Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I went to Hershey High School. I'm, I was born in 1995, and I majored in business, and that's because I hope to run my own business when I'm older and out of college. And an interesting fact, um, I'm also on the women's soccer team, and I really like artwork and anything with like artists and drawing and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brittany Goulart, and I'm from Canyon Lake, California, born in 1995. I'm majoring in communications and media. I found it really interesting. I really wasn't sure of what I wanted to major in, but that subject and like really interested me, so I figured, why not go for something that's interesting to me? And an interesting thing about me is that, well, I'm on the women's soccer team also, and I'm from California, which is kind of different to be traveling all the way out here to Newark, New Jersey, so. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Keeval. I was born in 1995. I went to Redland High School, which is around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm majoring in biology because I'm really interested in going into the field of physical therapy and health sciences. And I'm also on the women's soccer team. <laughs> so. Angela, you're not on the women's soccer team, right? 
<laughs> um, my name is Angelo Albano. Um, I was born in 1995. Um, I come from Bloomfield, um, New Jersey, but I was actually born in Singapore. Um, but I have Filipino parents, so yeah. Um, I come from, um, wait. I'm, I graduated from Abundant Life Academy in New Jer Nutley, New Jersey, um, which is about maybe 15 minutes from here. It's, um, I guess you can say a private Christian school, so yeah, and it's really, really small. Um, one interesting fact about me, I guess, is that you can say I like to play the piano. I've been playing for my church for maybe about six years now for the uh, praise and worship team, so yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Thomas Perka, uh, born in 95, um, graduated from Paramus Catholic High School from uh, Elmwood Park. Uh, major is still undecided, and um, I play hockey. Thanks. Hi, my name is Eunice Kanubis. I guess an interesting fact is my name rhymes. <laughs> and, um, I was born in 1995 and I graduated from Fairline High School in Fairline, New Jersey, and I'm majoring in biomedical engineering. And I'm not really sure what made me choose this major, but somehow it caught my attention, and I'm gonna <laughs> see how it goes. Uh, my name is Jennifer Causing. I was born in 1995, and I went to and graduated from Colonia High School in Colonia, New Jersey, which is in the Woodbridge District. Uh, my my current major is information technology because my dad, um, when I was little, like introduced me to working with computers, and I like being hands on with computing and programming. So that's why I'm going into information technology. One thing about me that's interesting is probably my height because I'm short. <laughs> Hi, my name is Promise Data. Um, born in 1995, graduated from Hasbro Heights High School. My major is computer engineering, and I just chose that because I'm really interested in computers and I like fixing them and stuff. Something interesting is um, I'm athletic. I like playing sports, especially soccer. Thank you. So we now know why you chose your majors. What we want to know is why you chose NJIT. Why did you decide to go to school here? Who wants to go first? So we're going for honest answers here, right? Yes. OK. So one of these days, I uh, woke up and I said to myself, man, college is expensive. And uh, I'm in a relatively affluent town. So I saw a lot of my friends going to these private schools that were going to suck 50000 or more a year out of their pockets. And they were going to have loans that were going to haunt them down for years after they graduated. And I said to myself, you know what? As much as I acknowledge that we need college, it's not the kind of investment that I want to make and go into debt over it's a stepping stone into the next big thing in my life. And so, you know, I applied here, I applied to Rutgers in New Brunswick, and I applied to Stevens. And uh, with the big thing, I was like, you know what, hey, if I'm gonna go bankrupt over this, I may as well do it in Hoboken, I love it there. But after that, I said to myself, you know what, this is gonna be affordable, I'm not gonna take any loans, I'm gonna pay for this out of pocket, I'm doing so to the best of my ability right now, and it's gonna be awesome. Um, then I showed up here and I really love the campus, you know, whatever people say about the area, I don't know, the campus is wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of technically minded people like myself, having spent my entire life around people that are not like that. It's going to be good and, you know, it's going to be great, you know. So NJIT has got electrical engineering, it's going to be awesome. And you know what, it's 20 minutes from my house. So I figure, you know what, I'm going to commute, I'm going to go here, I'm going to keep costs down and maybe even stick around for my master's, and I'm going to make this work. Great. Who else? Why did you choose NJIT? Yes? Well, I guess my selection was a little bit different, because when I started the recruiting process for soccer, I started looking at colleges when I was a freshman in high school. So one of the things that I really looked at was I wanted a rigorous institution. I wanted a place that wasn't too far away from home, me living in New Jersey. I wanted to stay in the tri-state. I wanted it to be affordable, and obviously the whole soccer as aspect, that was kind of important to me too. So when I was looking at colleges, I just, I really like the atmosphere here. Like I know it's in Newark, New Jersey, but the campus itself, it's enclosed. You wouldn't even know that you were in a 
dangerous city. And um, everyone was really nice. Both my parents went here, like I said, and they both had great, rewarding experiences. Uh, the technology in the labs, I liked everything about the labs, and it just seemed like it would be really rewarding for me. So I like it so far. I've been here for three weeks. <laughs> Wonderful. Who else? Um, NGIT was um, was one of my major choices since since I first started in high school itself. I put a lot of thought into it. It's extremely affordable. You guys have a really good prom program in civil engineering as well. Also, I live with a single mother, so my brother left back to Brazil. Um, my father passed away when I was really young, so I'm pretty much I have to take care of her since she's getting older and. Um, it's pretty close to my house. I need to commute, and I need I need to work. I need to study. I need it, everything has to be close so my life can I can start taking the first step of it. Great. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I kind of chose uh, similar reasons like uh, Raymond right here because the scholarship opportunities that came up to me. Um, I wanted um, the FYC. They were talking about um, a return on your investment. And that was very important to me. So uh, that was one key feature that I really, really liked. And it felt um, made me more confident in choosing this place, uh, NJIT. Um, and I came here on the campus. It was, it's a really nice campus. I mean, my first impressions of New York was, were from like Hale and Kumar go to White Castle. It was my first impression. <laughs> and, but um, you know, coming here, uh, it's a lot different. You know, so you can't judge book by its cover. It's a really nice uh, place. And I'm happy to be here at NJIT. Great. So seeing a show of hands, how many of you feel prepared for college next week? Okay. Now, how many of you, now why is that? Briefly, why? Why do you feel prepared? Who wants to, yep. Well, the reason why I feel very prepared for college is because at my school, St. Benedict's, they've been basically drilling us for five years to get ready for college, you know, 80 minute classes, you know, very, they're very punctual about practically everything. So and that's kind of what college is like. Like even in my US History II class, right, my teacher, what he would do is he wouldn't collect any homework assignments. He'd give us the syllabus, but he wouldn't really normally remind us when the homework is. So we would have to remember the homework assignment from the syllabus and do it from there. And he wouldn't collect it himself. He'll just tell us to. Well, actually, he wouldn't even tell us. We just have to put it on his desk. And I've also been, and not to mention on top of that, I've also been here at NGIT for two years before that for Upward Bound. And I've also done some pre-college stuff here at NGIT. So I've basically been getting ready for a long time. So next week is just going to, at least hopefully, would just be a smooth ride. At least that's what I hope. Now, does anyone else want to share why they feel ready? Uh, I feel ready because since sophomore year, I started. I took my first uh, college course, which was uh, financial uh, accounting at Rutgers here in Newark. Then my junior year, I went to a program in New Mexico for green energy and renewable resources, which really defined what I wanted to do. Also because in my school is a prep college uh, high school, and they had one specific class called AVID, which, it, which stands for Advancement via Individual Achievement, um, oh, via Individual and then Development at the end. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a class that prepares you. It teaches you how to be organized with everything, how to be on top of everything, how to even take uh, notes in class or even individually. To, to be very effective and you study on your own. So they, they actually were teaching us from the get-go how to be by yourself out there and how to be responsible for everything. So that's why I feel ready for it. Does anyone want to share any reasons that they maybe don't feel prepared? Yes? I'm going to go for a neutral standpoint here. I don't know of any reasons why I'm not prepared. I'm just going to show up in five days and smooth sailing from there. Oh, and I have the naming convention down, Nidget. Like, makes this whole place worth it, you know? Nidget. That's fun. Uh, it's not offending, right? No. Awesome. Anyone else? Why you might not be prepared? 
All right, so what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge your first year? Yes? Julia? Well, since I am playing soccer, just managing both my courses and my playing is going to be tough, so I'll have to keep track of things. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah, I feel like really the time management is going to be like the toughest thing to overcome, but um, I feel like my high school really prepared us for that. We were, um, we're a full international baccalaureate school, so we've been all taking college courses since junior year. So I feel pretty prepared, but probably just the time management. So how many people here feel time management is going to be a big challenge? Okay, so what do you think you're going to do to overcome that? So I learned my lesson about kind of uh, overextending myself several years ago in high school when I just kind of showed up freshman year and decided to take the hardest classes possible, all of them, and get involved in about three or four clubs and just kind of went on overload. Um, I know that I'm not going to do that this time around. I do have a busy schedule, just like everybody else here said, between, you know, multiple jobs, school, trying to get involved in a startup company right now that's probably going to rake in millions in the next 10 years. So, you know, it's going to be big, but I kind of know when to say it's too much and kind of drop off. And it's good that all those commitments that I have are with people that are really understanding and they've been in the position that I've been. And they know, hey, Ray's got to get settled in school, so we're going to give him a couple of weeks here and there. Just got to ask for it. Anyone else with strategies for dealing with time management? This might sound a little bit corny, but I think... Uh, in my school, they actually taught us how to really rely on having an agenda and writing everything down. The key word of everything is writing everything down and making an appointment for yourself. Then you really got to commit to it. And it's, it's pretty much how they, t how they prepared us. It's pretend that what are you doing? It's an actual job. If you're late for it, you're not getting paid. Pretty much saying if you're late with your stuff in college, you're not getting your grades, and, and so you're not getting a degree. So if you felt like any of you were in trouble, how would you go about getting help and let us know who you go to first and then who you go to second? Yes. Um, like, I've already reached out to a lot of upperclassmen for help before school even started, so that's what I do. So you'd reach out to them? Mm-hmm. How about anyone else? Who would you? Yes? Well, for soccer, um, I'd reach out to Sandra because she's, um, well, she helps organize our schedules with our classes, and she's kind of like our mother offside. <laughs> who kind of keeps us all in track, and I have a feeling I'm going to be asking her for a lot of help and advice here in the next year. So who else? Who would you reach out to second? Yes? Mr. Peppo. And the, who is Mr. Peppo? The dean of the Honors College. OK. Great. Excuse me one second. How many of you are in Honors College? Okay. How many, any of you in EOP? Okay. Thank you. So how would you think you'd know that you're in trouble? At what point would you say, I think I'm in trouble, I need to reach out to someone? I think like um, even before grades start dropping, you feel like a, certain, like a sense of urgency like you always feel like you're missing something. Like that's a big sign that what you're doing right now isn't very good time management right now. If you always feel like you're missing something, you always have to do something at a certain point, you feel like you're scrambled. So I think that's a big sign that you should worry that it's a problem now, you gotta have to do something about it. Who else, how would you know? Well, I gotta agree and disagree on that. I definitely know that whole scrambled concept of you know overextended, overstressing, yeah, if I start stressing out and freaking out, I know I gotta do something. But that bit you said about like you know just kind of like having to be someplace every minute of every day, I agree. But I think that's kind of like a fine line, you know, because if you have your day planned out to the minute, and you don't get backlogged, hey, I think that's a good thing. But the moment you go one minute over, you don't have enough time to kind of relax at the end of the day, then you know something's up. If I start feeling like anxious how I don't know any of the school, like any of the work that's going on in class, or if I'm feeling too stressed out, that's how I know I'm going to need to reach out for help. And I would probably go to like a close friend of mine or the professor, if anything. How long do you think it would take before you reached out for help? Should we say a week, two weeks, three weeks, month, a semester, how long? 
just start down there and just go? Um, I'd say probably a week or two, week not or too two. long. Okay, a couple other people? Um, okay. I guess maybe three days. I think the problem is most of the subjects that we learn is um, mostly foundational to learn the higher level of, of learning. So as soon as some, we miss a foundation and we build upon that, it provides an unstable foundation. So I guess it would be detrimental and I guess it would hurt our very own uh, learning and as soon as we reach to the higher levels. Okay, let's see a show of hands here. How many of you had at least one helicopter parent or a parent that tried to be a helicopter parent? And if you don't know what a helicopter parent is, Wikipedia defines a helicopter parent as one who pays extremely close attention to the child or children's experiences and problems, particularly at school. How many of you had a helicopter parent? How many of you think it'll be strange not to have that helicopter parent here watching you? <laughs> All right. Now, how many of you, let's see a show of hands again, are going to work when you're in college? OK, so how many of you are going to work more than 10 hours? More than 10 hours a week, yep. OK, now do you think that that's going to have an impact on your school? How many of you expect to graduate in four years? Let's see a show of hands. Four years, and then how about, uh, how many think you're going to be here more than five years? Five years or more? OK. What was your favorite high school learning experience, Thomas? Um. Get ready to answer. You're going to be picked up. I'd say probably we had this class senior year. Um, it was a, like a seminar class. It was uh, supposed to like prepare us for the like, college environment. Um, it, it was kind of like a group learning experience. We had a lot of group talking about like uh, the subjects we learned and things like that. So we, we would um, share our opinions on things. And Why did you like that? Oh, because it's very open. Like you could see what everyone else is thinking about what we're learning. Okay, Julia. Favorite high school learning experience. In high school, all four years, I actually took the class junior ROTC, and I learned a lot from it, like leadership skills, and just like time management again. And it really helped me like prepare myself for the college environment. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm not skipping anybody in particular. Philippe. My favorite experience in high school was developing kind of relationship with um, between the staff and friends in high school itself, due to the fact that you can really work it out. Like if you have, if you choose your friends right, you can work with them together and you can pretty much like break down all the work you need to do and you guys get together and get everything done. Okay. It's more efficient and much more. So you like working in groups? Yeah, um, okay. I'm actually, a, I'm, I consider myself kind of natural leader and I like to take the first step. Okay, we'll get back okay. to that. Promise, your favorite high school learning experience? Um, probably all the skills I learned on the soccer field. Like teamwork, that's, leadership, and stuff like that. That's legitimate. I mean, learning experience can happen everywhere, right? And you, you're telling us that it happened outside of a cla traditional classroom. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn? What are the most important pieces of what you learned? Well, like I was captain of my soccer team, so leadership, responsibility, stuff, stuff like that. OK. What was your worst high school learning experience? The one that you wish you could erase off the Face in the mat. Brittany. My worst high school learning experience would, well, I couldn't really figure out one of them that would be like more standing out, but. I'm sorry, you have to speak up a little sorry. bit. Sorry. I got, I'm an old guy and I hard to hear. My worst would have to be, it was a class that we had that was kind of, well, it's mandatory for graduation that we have to take it, but the way how that was run, the teacher didn't really care and he kind of let you do your own thing. That's kind of how it was. He didn't really 
like teach and take time. It was more of a self learning class, and it was like supposed. It didn't have like a good environment. Okay, you were left to your own devices. Sort of, but it was own devices, but you weren't provided with any material. Okay. I should say. Angelo, your worst high school learning experience. Um, I guess my worst one would be um, there was this one time, this one class where we had to. Um, it was kind of like um, an individualistic class where um, you had to do things on your own. And what I didn't like about it is that um, sometimes, it, I guess it's more down to the teacher because I really, he didn't really um, teach that well. And it was, um, I guess, uh, I think it was, it, it was hard to connect with him to see how, um, um, because like once we would ask a question, it was like, he would tell us to do it on our own and figure it out. And then at times that we had to figure it out on our own, but sometimes we couldn't because we needed help. So I guess down to the You didn't get the of, help that you needed yeah. from him? Okay. Joshua, worst high school learning experience and why? That's actually very difficult now that I think about it. I can't really think of too many parts in high school where I really just said, Man, I, you know, I really wish I forgot all about it. Because I learned a lot of things from high school. And I can't really say that I've learned something that I didn't want to learn, to be honest. So that's a, that's a very difficult question to ask, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Who didn't speak up? Yes. Jen. I guess I could say that the worst learning experience I had in high school was actually my probably my AP computer science. Cause Intro to computer science, even, it, even though it was like, it really geared me up to going to AP, really taught me programming. Once I got into AP, the t we actually knew just as much as the teacher did, so he wasn't really able to teach us more beyond. And so like we had to depend on textbooks, depend on each other, which I guess was really good because it got the class to collaborate, collaborate, with, collaborate with each other. But, but like, granted, getting help from the teacher, he wouldn't really know what to say. He'd just say, oh, just look in the textbook, look it up. It wasn't really, like, it wasn't really, like, what I expected from an AP class. But, it, but like, I, get, I did pass a class. It helped me learn. It helped me learn to, like, look for others, uh, do some research, and I'll be able to get through it. Okay. I want three words that describe your favorite teacher. Only three words. Eunice. Let's see, caring. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't know any two singular words to describe my favorite teacher. Um, caring. Anybody else want to take a shot? <laughs> All right, think. promise. Funny, caring, and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Jen. I guess honest, caring, and uh, enlightening. OK. Raymond. Uh, you can't sum it up in three words. It's not about words, because there's not enough words in all languages combined to explain how, some, how good some of my teachers have been. It's about that kind of like that connection that you feel with them, and just how awesome they are it's just like that you know all right but, awesome in connection <laughs> yeah let me let me think for a sec for a third uh dedication and dedication boom awesome connection and dedication good tala um for me um what i would describe is funny tenacious and understandable because um a teacher can also um be a friend at, at, at times, so, but also they understand that there is a goal that you have to reach. So they will help you towards that goal. So that's yeah. my favorite teacher taught me. So that's Thank what I just. You. Thank you. Ashley? Um, I'd say caring, compassionate, and just hardworking. All right, caring, compassionate, and hardworking. Thank you. My teacher would be best described as motivational, supportive, and extremely sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> How important is motivation uh, from the, in, in your teacher's, what, in the teacher's profile, what, and what they offer you? Well, it's very important for me because, like I said, my mom, 
she uh, I'm pretty much the first person to ever go to college in my whole family since I came I'm came from Brazil uh, education there is not very uh, strongly supported they just do it for I guess the heck of it but uh, being the first one to ever go to high school she was pretty much another mother figure that I ever had that she told me you can do it you have the potential to do it and I didn't believe myself until I met her and then when she put me in, in the right path I just took the right steps okay anybody else want to weigh in here yes Britton. My teacher, you could say, was more of a role model, supporting and helpful to me. Is role model, helpful? supporting and helpful. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, yes. Sure, please. So, when they just brought up motivation, that just really triggered something in my brain. And the thing is about it, it goes both ways. When you uh, when you have that bond with the teacher, and you kind of tell them, hey, like he actually understood technology. He was a tech teacher, and I would come to him with all these projects I had in mind. And yeah, he was definitely motivational. He drove me to do a lot of stuff. But there were occasions where he was just like, Ray, you know, this isn't feasible. You know, coming from the, I don't know, he had his reasons. And he had more life experience than I did, of course. So when he just told me, you know, Ray, I don't think this is going to work or don't do it this way, I just kind of took that to heart. And I listened to him 100%. And in retrospect, had I not, had I not put so, much, so many eggs in one basket, so to say, might have actually made a few more things happen. So it just kind of, that was a big learning lesson that I realized after graduation. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. One question, everybody raise your hand if, you, if this has happened. Have you ever been intimidated so that you didn't feel like you wanted to speak up in class? Raise your hand if it's happened to you. OK. And anybody wants to give us an example without mentioning any names? No? OK. Uh, if it comes back up. Have you ever spoken or challenged the teacher if you believed he or she was wrong? I'm going to show of hands. Anybody would, wouldn't do it again? <laughs> All right. So you like the ability, you feel it's when, they're, when a faculty member is open to you, you're much more open to them? You like that? OK. Um, have you ever studied in a study group? Let's see a show of hands. Study groups. How many people prefer to, to study in study groups? All right, vast majority. Um, how many of you find your average lecture, when you know a, a standardized lecture? How, how many of you find your actual standard lecture engaging? Thank you. What do you think your freshman instructors will be like? Yes. It could go two ways. They could either. Uh, take it easy and be like, okay, you guys are high school students, just coming up, and we're gonna show you the baby steps. Or they could try having us having extremely mental breakdown and just cry our hearts out every night. Let's throw you in, theory. throw you in the deep end. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Um, was cheating of any kind prevalent in your high school? An answer yes. If Show of hands, if cheating was prevalent in your high school. Thank you. Um, what percentage of your fellow high school students cheated at least once? Um, how many of you would say 50% or more? How many of you would say 70% or more? How many would you say 90% or more? OK. Scary. Well, were you 100%? <laughs> It's pretty high. OK. Uh, were you ever told anything in high school about copying and pasting from the internet? That it might be a violation of the law? Yes. Yes, uh, throughout, even throughout all my English classes, I was always made aware to never, ever, ever even consider copying and pasting anything from any site, especially without a citation or anything. You are. Yeah. I'm a librarian. You just made my day. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Also, talking about the citation, I also learned about MLA format, which they're 
They're, they were really strong about it. Can, I, can you tell us what MLA format is, if there's anybody in the room who doesn't know? Yeah, uh, MLA format, it's uh, a format that once you're doing a project or so, a page has to be set up in the right way. You need a header, like your name, date, everything, and each page needs to have your last name on the right, on the top right, and like your last name and the number of pages you're having. Also, by the end of the page, you we got to keep it brief. We got to okay. keep it brief. And, and just Let me just ask everybody else: How many of you know or have heard about and actually use the MLA format at one time or another? Very good. Thank you. That was very helpful. All right. So now I have some questions about technology. In one sentence, how do you feel about your teachers using technology in class, Jen? Uh, I guess. It can go one or two ways. One way could be like it helps students engage more. The other way being like they're more su they can be a little susceptible, susceptible oh, to like cheating or getting off track with the lesson by using the technology. By using technology, but I still think technology is like a very reasonable thing to use in the classroom. Who who else, Raymond? This is an institution of technology. You kind of have to, but in moderation to prevent the effects that were just mentioned. Who else? Karen? The name of my high school is Biotechnology High School. We used a lot of technology, and it was always extremely helpful. Who else? Courtney? Um, my high school, they used it a lot, but they never used it very well. Like, it was always pointless. Like, they just like, make you use it for no reason when you could just write it down, or they would make you print something out when you could just write it down. So I don't, like, if I have to use it, I'll use it, but I more prefer to, like, write things down or not, because it became a big distraction. Like, oh, use your phones, and then everyone would just play games on their phone. So, like, I didn't think it was very useful. So let's see a show of hands. How many of you have taken an online course before coming here? So one, two, three, four, five, about... All right, um, did you prefer that to the face-to-face -face environment? Yes? Um, it's complicated, because if you're at home staring at your computer screen, which I already do for seven to eight hours on my day off, um, it's easy to get disengaged, because you've got all your distractions right there in the same little rectangular screen. Uh, it's very convenient for people who, you know, can't make the drive down to a physical classroom or want to do this in the middle of the night when said instructors would be asleep or so on and so forth. But it, I don't think it can be a complete solution. It does have to come with a face-to-face -face environment. Maybe as a supplement, it would be very convenient. Okay, now we had a whole bunch of other questions, but we're running out of time. So what we wanted to do... I'm going to ask one last question, okay. and then we'll ask the audience. The last question is, how many hours per week do you expect to study your freshman year? All right. How many hours a week do you expect to study? Those who are studying five or less, raise your hand. Five to 10 hours, 10 to 15 hours. All those with 15 or, or zero to 15 hours, anybody who's in that range, who, who didn't raise their hand? How many are left? 15 or more hours. Nobody's going to study 15 or more hours. Okay, thank you. What did we have, I'm sorry, I didn't ask that very well. It was not very coordinated. Um, we want to have a chance for a couple people to ask questions. Uh, if anybody's here who wants to ask a question, there are mics, um, yeah, in the back. So, really, two questions. Bunch of you are athletes. How, how's the team look this year? <laughs> I'm a big soccer fan, so I hope the team looks good. And uh, do you think that your involvement with the team, one way or the other, is, uh, is going to give you any sort of uh, edge or added advantage here? Uh, well, on the soccer team, there's a lot of us that have very similar majors. I know that there's only one other chemical engineer on the team, but she's a junior. So she told me that any time during my experience here, while she's here, she's welcome to help me, tell me about the, all the professors, <laughs> give me some insight. So I feel like that's great, and I feel like I have an edge there. Anybody else? 
Yes, David. Uh, two uh, practical questions. Would you prefer e-books or regular textbooks? The first question. And the second question, if we gave you a choice between group assignments or personal assignments in class, which would you prefer? Let's go e-books. Raise your hand. Show of hands for who prefer So e how many would prefer an e-book? Raise your hand over okay. a traditional textbook. Those who would not prefer, who would prefer regular textbooks, raise your hand. Okay, and the second. <laughs> Second question, David. What was your second question? I lost it. Oh, okay, I won't comment. Um, the second question is would you prefer personal homework assignments or group homework assignments? Personal homework assignments. Raise your hand high. Raise your hand. All right, mm -hmm. all right, put your hands down. Now, group assignments. Okay. One or two people. Uh, um, I usually, like, I'll work in a group if I have to, but I like doing things more on my own because I can do it the way I want to do it, and I know I'll get it done in a timely manner versus having to wait for other people's schedules and work around what they want to do, especially because of soccer, it's going to be a lot different than other people. So if I can just get something done when I want to get it done, I don't have to, like, stress about it. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Your last opportunity, Rich. Nope. Thank you very. Oh, we got one more question, Dr. Bladikas. No. Well, I we have lots more questions we would ask, but we are out of time. So we have tons on. of questions. We, we ran out of time. Because, uh, first of all, I would like to make a suggestion if the the rest of the audience uh, agrees. I like what I am hearing, and I'm learning. Can we continue with this panel and maybe cut short a, a little bit of the other stuff later on? <laughs> we, we can, we, you can ask for a show of hand from this side for that. Uh, but, but for them, uh, one question. How many of you are not 100% sure about your major? Some of you expressed doubts and said, maybe I'll do this. How many of you are not 100% sure? Well, Rich is talking to Dave, but... We're trying to come okay. to an agreement on what we're doing. Here. Keep going. <laughs> well, while, while, they're, going. while they're talking, I'll, I'll ask some of the other questions. So uh, we talked about e-textbooks. Um, here you go. So ask a question. How many of you feel that technology such as mobile devices, digital textbook, e-readers, and tablets save you time when studying and learning? Okay, so raise your hand real high. So it looks like one, two, three, four. All right, so we can see these hands here. Now, we were talking about um, numbers earlier, and earlier, I'd Rich. Like hear, I'd like to hear a reason for why you think the technology saves you time. Would anybody like to volunteer that? Yes. Technology can save you a lot of time because, for example, I, I guess all of us as our cell phones are here right now, and if we had a break, for example, if I'm at work, I can actually take a look at my phone and take those like 30 minutes to study a little bit or look at what I have to do and when I get home I can actually get to it so like it's extremely efficient and okay. good for you. <laughs> hey Raymond? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go until we're yanked off the stage I guess. Saves me a lot of money. I have to clarify about the ebook question. I downloaded my ebooks and then I printed them out so I've got a win-win situation going. <laughs> um, but what he said about the screens definitely holds true. You know I have a physical copy that I like to work off of you know I've got enough glare on my eyes the other eight hours of the day. I do like trees in flat form. But then, you know, middle of the day, you know, hey, oh, look, five minutes, read my textbook, done deal. And I also have this really cool tablet with a pen, so I can just take notes, draw, uh, so on and so forth. So, so it's like paper, but digital. So. so talking about tablets, right, what we want to know is how many different devices you use in a typical day. This could be a smartphone, a tablet, a desktop, a laptop. Show your hands if you use one or more device a day. All right, so that's probably all of you. How about two devices or more a day? Keep your hand up. Three, four, okay. So that gives people an idea of how many devices you're using. Now let's see, uh, while Rich and I figure out what's going on, show us uh, by a show of hands, how many of you have laptops? Everybody. Pretty much everyone? Everybody, okay. How many of you own uh, iP uh, iPads or other tablets? Now, do you plan on bringing your laptops or iPads to class? Raise your hand if you think you will. 
Now, how many of you think your instructor will let you use them in class? How many of you think your instructor will say no? And why? Why do you think they might say that, Courtney? Um, I think they might say no because if my screen's up, they don't really know what I'm looking at. Like I could just be on Twitter or something. So they might want me to focus and they wouldn't want my laptop out. Now if you had a laptop, how many of you think you might occasionally find yourself on Twitter or Facebook or? <laughs> okay, now here's a question. How would you prefer to be communicated with from your, by your faculty? How would you like your faculty to communicate with you? But in an ideal world, about your courses, obviously. Josh? You want? Uh, through email, usually. Anyone else besides email? Any other preferences? It's cool to have digital communication. I'd love to be able to pull up a list of everything I have to do on my screen without any effort on my part. But there's no replacement in my mind for the old school, hey, do this, buy this, verbally said to my face, you know? It's good to hear that. That's going to be a wake up call in a week or two. Hey, didn't that guy tell me to do that thing? Oh, yeah, it's tomorrow. Let's make that happen. How many of you text 100 or more times a day? Don't, how many, you don't have to be how many of you check hand? your text uh, once an hour or, or less? Once an hour or less. How many of you check it more, th more often than once per hour? How often do you check your text? Well, it all depends on what's going on that day. You know, you could have a Typically. really fun event, but easily, like, probably at least more than 20 in an hour. I kind of like talking to my friends back at home and things. Do you find the text uh, interrupts you when you're trying to do some work? Do you find it an annoyance? How many of you find it an annoyance? How many of you actually turn your phones off even if you're annoyed, though? <laughs> How many of you checked your text? while you were waiting or while you were on the panel up here? Show of hands. <laughs> How about on the panel? Any of you, have you checked it while you're sitting here? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think we used up all the available time unless somebody has one last question. You have your, over here, over here. You guys are all obviously going to do great while you're here, but before you got here, we were talking about retention and those students who don't do great in their first year. So they've been accepted. We expect them to do great, but for a number of reasons, some of them don't. So what do you think are some of those reasons that some of your fellow students might not make it through their first year of college? Yes, why don't we start down here? Uh, poor time management could be one of the reasons. Okay. Any other reasons? Karen? Well, weren't we just ranked like the number five math program out of all the uh, technical universities? So probably the math program. Uh, sometimes overconfidence can be a problem too for some students. So they might think they uh, know more than they actually do or they think they're more capable than they actually are. How many of you think that's a problem with your age group, overconfidence, huh? It's a problem with humanity. Yeah, maybe so. How many of you think it's a problem with your age group? Okay, interesting. Um, anybody else want to take a answer? Yes. Uh, not taking college serious. Pretty much, people thinking about the party life and stuff like that, and also procrastination, which is a, a huge thing that a lot of us do. I think everybody here, including teachers and students. <laughs> okay, I have something I want to ask you. you. This is your opportunity to tell your freshman faculty member one thing that you want them to do to make your life better this year so that you're better, you're su more successful in your learning. What can they, they do to help you? Visual aid. Visual aid, okay. Um, I really don't like lectures. I don't like being talked at. I get really bored and I like zone out, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Active learning, like actually working as like you're learning to have something in your hands so, like you're doing of like what's going on, what you're being talked about. Have something like going through, like you're not just there like listening forever. You're actually like working with each other as like you're learning, so you're learning together and like how many of you agree with those three things that were just mentioned? Okay, all of you. 
Uh, anybody else wants to throw in something? Yeah, uh, down here. You need some. Um, creating connections with the students and creating a comfortable learning environment where everybody won't feel intimidated by other students. So okay. they could like ask questions and they won't feel like um, they're less than anybody else. Okay, thank you. Did you have something, Jen, that you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, just mostly like agreeing with the fact that like creating a connection with all of your fellow students, creating connection with the faculty, all of your professors, trust makes a easier tra an easier transition into your first semester into college, seeing that like, hey, I'm not the only person who's nervous. They're trying to help me feel comfortable. I'm gonna feel a lot more comfortable being around everyone, seeing as they're like motivating me to do what I want. Uh -huh. Um, two things. Uh, one, um, that's what my teachers did in high school, and I really enjoyed it. It's promoting comprehension over memorization. Um, and also, with the Cal professors, um, please, please let us use Wolfram Alpha. Uh, for, please use what? Wolfram Alpha. Uh, don't ban that in class. Uh, uh, <laughs> it does the calculus for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would say be organized because some of my high school teachers weren't very organized and I know in those classes I tended to get more like hectic with everything and it didn't help me so. Okay, thank you. Angelo? Um, I guess um, one would be approachability. Like it would be nice if we have the knowledge that we can approach the professor or instructor that we can ask questions. And another thing would be um, the ability to um, to apply what we learn, because I believe that if we just look, uh, memorize it, it's what um, Tala said. If we if memorization is not, it's not that much learning. But once you apply it, I guess there's a better retention rate to it. So yeah. Yes. Uh, not being monotone. I think that's one thing that puts all of us to sleep. Like, if you're talking like this the whole time while you're lecturing, I think none of us are going to pay attention and we're going to just gonna zoom out. So being heard is important. Yeah, and just, just, I guess, using diverse methods. You can lecture, but just be interactive in a way. Okay, last word. Uh, clear communication. I'd actually like to know what's expected of me, and please not in the form of a syllabus that is handed to me on the first day of school to be lost an hour later and never talked about again. Something else. Words, verbal, please. Thank you. Okay, anybody else last, we'll have one more last chance. Uh, is there any question I should have asked today that I didn't ask you? What did I miss? Yes, Bruce? Yeah. I'd like to know how many of you have, if, uh, are prepared for your first day of class. You have your books, have you done whatever work is required for the first day? Have you looked at the syllabus or maybe another one? How many of you feel prepared? Show of hands for the first day of class. <laughs> you haven't gotten your schedule? No. All right. That answers your question, I think, Bruce. Thank you very much. Give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs>